Welcome to Let's Chit Chat, sis. We are on the porch today with Kimmy, CG, and our special guest, Pamela, or Pam. Pam, you let us know how you like to be addressed. Pam is fine. <laughs> awesome. So Pam is here with us today, and we just thought that we would kind of touch on a, a really hot topic. Um, we are talking about today uh, critical race theory. And so that might um, be put offing to some people who are listening, or it might cause some confusion because you've heard the terminology used, but not quite sure how to use it or what it is and what the big hoopla is about it. And I believe that just the other day, one of the governors um, said they should take you know critical race theory out of the schools, which I don't even think that they're teaching it in. And in, in that level, you know, of secondary education or primary school, whatever the case may oh be. My God. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> I just kind of, uh, when I hear it myself, you know, I, I, I thought I understood what it was, but um, with uh, Pam's background in, in law, we thought that we would invite her mm -hmm. so that she could give us a high level explanation as to what CRT actually is. So we're not here to debate the theory. We're not here to, you know, be on one side or the other, or, you know, we're not here to do anything. We're just here to offer information. And so, um, you know, we like to have fun, but we also like to make sure that we educate our listeners and um, educate ourselves. And so that we're working from a place of um, proper knowledge as opposed to assumption. So Pam, welcome again. Thank you yes. for being with us, with us this evening. And Kimmy and CG, I hope you both are doing well today. Well, I am. I had a long day, but you know, the day was a pretty nice day outside. So I really enjoyed that. Um, I know some cold weather is coming, but it was nice outside. And you know, sunshine makes you feel better. Yes. I mean, and I'm not, a, I'm not a warm weather person. But sunny days make you feel better. So I'm mm -hmm. appreciative of a nice warm, well, I won't say warm, but a nice day with some sunny day makes it warm. It does, yeah. How about you, CG? And everything's good. I don't got nothing nice to say about the cold, man. I'm ready for this to go. So uh, <laughs> All right, as soon as that warm weather comes in, I'm good. I'm ready to get back on my bike and ride. So I, I need this to go now. <laughs> but it did feel good today. It was good. I agree yeah. with that. So for our, list, or for our listeners, if you don't already know, we are all mostly East Coast people. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a typical January here, or should I say uh, a cold January, because with us, you never know what you're going to get. And so um, we are hoping that uh, spring comes early because we are already over this winter. So Didn't that groundhog die? They, one of the did groundhogs die. did die, but I don't know where he was located. What does that even mean? That means just that just, just like, like the law, you, you got two different answers, right? <laughs> Depending on who you ask. <laughs> it just means that the one they were using ain't here no more and they got to get you. <laughs> the one so that's in our nice. area, Chauncey, um, he said it was going to be six more weeks of winter. But he then did. somebody had this Mimi out where his wife was in Florida and said that he always lied. So you just <laughs> will never trust him. <laughs> I was like, that was so funny. I have to send it to y'all. So um, yeah, I hope I hope the um, I like cold weather though. I'm not gonna lie, I just don't like the precipitation and you know rain. Um, I can deal with snow, but the raining, dreary days, I, I I can do without. But we all here above above ground, so that's a good okay. day. We'll take it. We'll take it. So Pam, I think I'm going to kind of let you start it off because again. As I explained, we're just looking for a high level overview as to what uh, critical race theory is so that when folks begin to hear it, they'll understand so that they won't be making um, judgments 
based on uh, misinformation. Yes. Yeah, so um, I don't know how high level it's going to be. I'm not an expert in critical race theory, but I think part of the controversy is that there are quite frankly, multiple definitions of critical race theories and also multiple interpretations of how it should be presented. But at its core, mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's really as um, controversial as um, the media would have everyone believe. So at its core, critical race theory really grew out of critical legal studies. And that came about, or the discussions came about and the theory around the concept that the law itself is not apolitical or objective, that a lot of what uh, passes for, I guess you would say neutral or unbiased law really is grounded to some extent in race and in race, racism. Okay. And we should understand how race and racism intersects with the laws as they stand and then examine how we could go about fixing it to address the inequity, inequities that kind of flow from that type of um, underpinning of the law. So, so that's kind of at its core what it is. Now, where the controversy comes in is one, you have to accept or believe arguably that race and racism does affect our jurisprudence. And if you accept that idea, then you then have to say, well, how do we go about addressing it? Mm -hmm. And the problem that you run into or the conflict that you run into is the fact that if you think about our idealized version of what our legal system is in particular, but, it, but basically the, the core of American values is this idea of colorblindness mm -hmm. and, and neutrality. Mm -hmm. So if you think about critical race theory or critical legal studies, it really is in conflict. There is a true tension between that school of thought and this idea that the law is blind. If you even think about the symbol for our legal system, what is it? It's a woman that's blindfolded holding the scales of justice. So it's this idea that when we are a country of laws, not of men, we don't take, we don't pass our laws at least on it on their face with the idea that we're going to affect the different races or ethnicities um, differently than one another. And so when you have a theory that says, I understand what the idealized version of the law is, and I understand what the idealized um, societal story is, but we have to understand what the realities are and then put systems in place to address it. And so that's really where I think you get the tension. I, I don't think it's really controversial or even most people, even those who are opposed to critical race theory would argue that there has at a minimum been a disparate impact um, as it relates to the law and other um, aspects of society as it relates to people of color, but in particular black people in America. Mm -hmm. But you still have to address how do we go about addressing those inequities and doing so in a way that doesn't totally uh, decimate or, or ignore the idea or the idealized version of a colorblind society. And I think that's really where we are. And if you think in terms of examples of, well, how, does the law or how does the laws as they exist today and even how they existed in the past um, manifest itself today? If you look at housing segregation, um, how housing segregation, excuse me, that's my dog in the background. And when we know. <laughs> I, know, I just had to mute mine because they was all going crazy. And, um, I think my husband's going to get the dog. Um, but if you think about how housing segregation impacts education and then how education impacts occupational choices and occupational choices in, in wealth in the, in the Black community in particular, how that affects um, generational wealth, how that generational wealth affects um, 
your income taxes, your taxes, just the taxes you pay, what gets taxed, what doesn't get taxed. Um, so you see how one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And so that's where you have people who are for critical race theory saying, well, we need to understand what effects have past inequities still remain with us and then how do we take measures to address those. So I would think that would be at its core, the basic of what critical race theory is. That was a really good explanation. <laughs> it really was. It broke it down and I made sure that I took, took some good notes. <laughs> good notes. Some good notes. Um, CG, did you have any questions or statements? Go ahead, CG. I guess, uh, <laughs> and I'll try to yeah. answer. <laughs> it, it's, it's really interesting to hear, hear it from this perspective because <clears throat> A lot of the pushback that I've that I've had in life when it comes to like talking about uh, issues within the black community, even just talking to people outside of our community I, at this age now, I mean, because I was one of those kids in school, I used to argue with the teachers. I used to argue with the teachers in elementary school, middle school, I would argue with them all the time. Like, you're not teaching history correctly. Like, that's not how it went down. Um, we always had that, you know, the, uh, the kind of savior complex, you know, within within, you know, school as far as like teaching, as far as like teaching history, and it seemed like, you know, black history was always kind of like a side note. Um, so as I've gotten older, what I've kind of realized as I've gotten older, um, a lot of my like white friends don't even know that, don't even know our history. So like, I think a lot of the pushback is also gonna be because of that as well. And I don't think that's like maybe necessarily like malicious or intentional. It's just, they didn't get it. Like I have one friend who's in who's in real estate and it's like you were saying about the zoning and everything, she's, she doesn't even know about it. I'm 35 years old. This woman does not know anything about like how real estate, how policy within real estate was used to keep us out of certain communities. Red so, line? Not a, she has no clue? A lot of people don't. I've come to realize like a lot of people don't know our history. They don't, they, because like, all right, so you hear like, if you've ever talked with like, had a debate with anybody, they'll always say, well, slavery is over. But they don't really understand everything that happened within Jim Crow. They don't understand. They just thought like, oh, you're free. You're free to, you know, move about the economy. You can participate in this economy, you know, at the full capacity. And that's not really what happened. Um, that's not what happened at all. And I don't think a lot of people not, I think a lot of people don't know. So I, I guess like, how, how are we going to overcome that barrier with making sure that not only we understand that at that level, but everybody else understands and learns this history as well because mm -hmm. i think that's a, that's an important com you know component as well right i mean i i think like you said we're calling it critical race theory and there's a difference between critical race theory and, and teaching history history is it, it already right. happened so if you're talking right. about something that already happened if you think about it it probably really shouldn't be controversial. It either did or didn't happen. Now mm -hmm. there could be different interpretations as to why something Different. happened right but right. in terms of if it happened it's generally provable I mean unless someone's just making something up right. um even if you think about in terms of uh, slavery or you say some people say well once slavery was over we were all now on an even playing field but if you really think about it slavery was actually and I don't mean it in a pejorative to say it was easy but the laws initially addressed how slaves would be treated. Slaves right. get the, accounted as three fifths of a person, et cetera, et cetera. Right. If you're this part of, or if you're on this side of the Mason Dixon line, you're a slave. If you're on the other half, you're not. Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually after slavery where you really start seeing race being codified within the legal system. If you think about the black codes and segregation mm -hmm. prior to that, it almost wasn't a need for the law right. to address race directly because you were a slave or you were a free person. Um, and it was really after slavery where you really see, where you would say the law is more intersecting with race and having a real um, effect on the lives of people of color and blacks in particular. Um, how you address that, again, that's, for someone probably in, with a higher pay grade than myself. <laughs> um, but as history is history, you just teach it. Um, 
will there be problems with the way some people teach it versus other people? Sure, because as people teach things, various people have different agendas, just like with other types of history, people have different agendas, but I don't necessarily think that's a reason to ignore it. It's mm -hmm. just, you have to be thoughtful in presenting it and also teach it at the level of your audience. Um, I do think it puts teachers in a, a very difficult position, mm -hmm. um, given the fact that it is a very sensitive topic. And just as you um, pointed out, a lot of your cop or a lot of your peers were not, you know, taught this, and they are now teachers. Mm -hmm. And now we're expecting them to do something that they have no experience with. And then we're going to hold them accountable. So there's a whole legal aspect to that, that really nobody's addressing. And I think that's probably why I would guess that a lot of school districts really don't want to get into the fray, because I think it not only presents ethical issues, um, as well as, you know, just logistical issues, but also legal issues as well. And then who can teach something that they're really uncomfortable with, right? Regardless of whether they have a, whether they're an expert in it or an expertise. And how I understand teaching to be is that, um, you know, when you come up with your syllabus or when teachers are selected, is that necessarily what you studied when you were in school? So you're fortunate if you went to school and you studied math and now you're teaching math, right? right. But you went to school and got a general studies degree or a lib and now it's a liberal arts, a liberal arts degree. And so now you're teaching chemistry. And so is that really, you know, your specialty? So, <laughs> um, no, no, I, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, really, isn't, that, isn't that how it works in some school districts? Yeah, because it's, yeah. it's need-based. It's not, you know, specialty a la carte you know. what you you know, what you specialize in, let's now make a, 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 a room for you, you know, so unfortunately, the, the whole educational system is challenged, in, especially in um, elementary and, and uh, middle schools and high schools, you know, um, a lot of things are going on. But a question I wanted to pose is, um, and, and I'm wondering why the, the, the rumor mill of about critical race theory is really addressing that if it's taught, it's going to offend white people. It's going to make them look bad and it's going to offend them. So that's where a lot of the, the misunderstanding is. I mean, facts is facts, you know what I mean? What happened, laws were put into place, you know, and we are all probably, um, we can contest to things that have happened in our own lives. But what people are saying now and what the big pushback is, is that they don't want their child to be in school um, and me meant to feel a certain type of way because when you go over these these issues that are going on and that are proceeding now, they are going to reflect back into history to say, you're, you're talking about something that's really irrelevant and you're trying to make, you know, make us feel bad. You know what I mean? Where I think that is something that's overblown. That's just my opinion. I think it's overblown because if we can't face what it is, how can we rectify it? You see what I'm saying? And I agree with you. I, but I also feel like what's the flip side of that, right? So you're saying, oh, if we teach this, then our white children are going to feel bad because they're going to feel like their family's own slaves. But the flip side of that is, will they might feel empowered? Might they feel empowered because their family owns slaves? There's two sides to that, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean everybody's going to feel bad, whereas some people might be like, is that what we're doing? Well, I mean, and I think it, it also depends how it's taught. I mean, you can teach it in an offensive manner. So it, it's not a totally unwarranted concern, I guess you would say, but it can be taught in an offensive way and it can be taught in a non-offensive way. Um, it depends who's teaching it. And again, we go back to who will we have teaching it and what type of training and sensitivity will they be taught before they bring this arguably to children at the primary and secondary school level? College is, is more of a choice. So you either take those classes or you don't. Um, 
but also just realistically, most white people, even within their ancestry, didn't own slaves. The real question is whether or not you own slaves, is there some benefit or some disadvantage that certain Americans have because they either were born one race or another or they weren't. And that's the real issue because if it was really just an issue of who owned slaves and who didn't and who would feel bad if their ancestry owned slaves, most people would have no reason to have any type of guilt because most people, white or otherwise, did not own slaves. That's just a fact. Um, well, I but guess that's it why doesn't I mean to... Go ahead. that they don't benefit from some remnants of the slave trade mm -hmm. and right. the racism that followed that. Right. That's why I think it's a, um, I don't know, just the sound of the critical race theory, I think it sends people into an alarm type of state, you know, like something terrible is going to be said that is going to be personalized or generalized to just Caucasian people. And I think if people even just took the opportunity, I mean, think about it, the, the Virginia governor, the day one, he signed in the law, that wouldn't be taught. You know what I mean? That already sends shockwaves, like, why? You know? But then what, what isn't being taught? So the, this is where my, my question comes in, right? We're calling it CRT, right? Because we're speaking on it uh, from a certain level. So right. why is it on an elementary level that now it's not going to be taught? Is that history? Just plain old history? Yes, because don't they concern you? teaching it in the first place. I mean, huh? I went exactly. to school in you know, Virginia and North Carolina, so they're not teaching this stuff. I mean, I've uh, learned most of Black history through my mom taking me to the library. This The stuff that they're teaching in school, I mean, like I said, I'm 35, so... You know, they weren't teaching hardly anything. I mean, whenever we had, you know, courses on Black history in school, like, I was like basically like one of the only people in my classroom that could actually speak on it because none, none of these topics were even covered. So, I mean, I mean, it's going to be a really hard, hard gap trying to, you know, you know, fill up into, you know, having these discussions about how policy and law really shaped our country when, you know, they aren't even understanding, you know, that that one part it's easy to gaslight us about this stuff it's very easy to gaslight us about this stuff to Absolutely. you know when, when nobody when nobody's like being honest about you know the real history where i mean they're trying to rebrand our history right now as far as like how they're teaching it is uh, i believe I, I don't know which state it is but as far as like trying to call us slaves and indentured servants now you know it's it's what? there's a lot of yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I have, you know, children and I can say I can't say that their African American history or black history was extensive, but I didn't see within their textbooks misinformation, maybe mm -hmm. there could have been more, <laughs> but right. I didn't see misinformation and, and how critically they really examine the subjects, probably not so much. I, I'm going to guess they read the paragraphs and took a test later on. Um, <laughs> but I, if anything, I think it's more of an ignoring of certain aspects of history than someone actively trying to change what happened. At least that's mm -hmm. been my experience. Um, if I just yeah. think about myself, you know, I grew up and went to, you know, Philadelphia public schools. Um, I was in magnet programs and, but I must admit in high school, my history teachers, um, they went in deep and they were Caucasian teachers. I think I have one social studies teacher who was, um, you know, African-American woman, mm -hmm. but um, those white teachers went in deep. That was the first time I had heard about Black Wall Street. It was from a white history teacher. It was not from um, a Black history teacher. So like, you know, to, to Pam's point, um, they had things in those history books or in the lessons that we were given it's just a matter of how deep did they go? Was it more surface or was it a little bit more entailed and how did all of it align? So since um, that American history really studied um, that period of you know pre-Civil War, Civil War and post-Civil War, then yeah, they went in pretty deep. And so um, I'm fortunate because I, I had- And this that. was at the high school level? 
this was on the high school level. You know, I went to high school for international affairs, now Bodine, but um, it was definitely um, very in-depth. But I, I know my counterparts at other schools, um, yeah, you know, say. you might have had something I different. Went to, I went to Catholic school, and I can tell you, I don't even, I, it wasn't even in our books. You know, right. on, in February, you got to do a little celebration, and, you know, um, Martin Luther King, when he died or when he was born, that was addressed. But, you know, Catholic schools kept it strictly religion. You know what I mean? They weren't getting into Black history. And I'm. I, it was probably only one Black lay teacher in the school. You know, um, that was high school. But elementary school, that was a little different. They touched on it more, I think, because my elementary school was 90% Black, you know, so it would have it would behoove them not to address it, you know, but my high school was 20% black, you know, so that was just glossed over, not even really addressed at all. And they leaned on the concept that you're in Catholic school, you're really learning about um, your education and the religious aspect of, um, of you being a good person and, you know, so on and so on. So that wasn't even really addressed. I like Chauncey said. It depends on, I guess, where you're at. But I know my parents um, probably just like CG and just like um, Chauncey. You know, that was self-taught at home. You know, what I mean, that wasn't something left to the school to do. You know, it was like because we know that that's when people physically went to the library and you know, and we pulled out books and either if you got in trouble or whatever, that was going to be something you was going to read. And this was going to be an assignment that you went, especially in the summertime. That was just a known thing that my mom just sent us a sixth street to the library, get a book. And we had to, um, you know, give her a, a book report, like, you know, in, at our childlike age. So um, I think that's where we learned a lot of it. Where are we at now? Um, I think they're challenging even addressing you know, the aspects. And like you said, Pam, I think it's not um, misinformation. I think it's just omitting information. You know, if they make you feel better, if you just take this out and not even mention it, you know, but then you have to- I think they mention it. I just think it's more, it's, it's glossed over, but I don't know if, I guess where I have some issues issue with with people who are for critical race theory and not because I'm opposed to the theory itself mm -hmm. but just where I see the conflict and the tension is I think some people think there's and there are some people who are actively working against giving people more information and then there's some people and I think these may be the individuals who get offended because they're not actively trying to harm anyone or withhold information it's just we have to get through all this information and we're going to have to make choices. And now we're being put in the position of being the bad guys because we are offending some people by putting in this or not putting in that or presenting this information this way versus that way. And I think a lot of people given today's, you know, um, sensitivities are just very leery mm -hmm. and, um, just very cautious about doing anything, whether it, particularly as it relates to anything involving race and, and having no malicious intent, but just are very leery about addressing the subject because at the end of the day, somebody's <laughs> going to be offended somebody. and somebody's not going to like what you're doing. And so I think truthfully, a large portion of the school district school districts are more apt to lean away from it mm -hmm. than to lean into it because it's just wrought with with problems <laughs> and, and wrought with controversy that mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. just don't want to deal with yeah um, but it doesn't it kind of make you feel like um you know it makes me think of some of the books that we read when we were in school right so um fahrenheit 451 do you remember that? Anyone remember I that? Remember right. I think so one of my children. 451, um, Ray, Bab Ray Bradbury. Um, so it's about how they're burning the books so that people don't learn the history of 
what has what has actually happened in the past. So then that way they can control what you know, how much you know of it and everything. So it just kind of makes me think of that. Um, That's a good one. Yeah. No, I, no, I understand. Like, I do believe there are some people who are malicious, but I think there's a lot of people that aren't malicious, right? That just don't want to touch it. And, and if they want, if you want your children to learn certain things, that you, you may have to take that. it upon yourself to teach them. My mom was actually very active in in, in teaching us about various aspects of Black history, Black Wall Street, Tulsa, things like that. She took that on herself, so she never really kind of relied on the school to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's more where I come from. Mm -hmm. the, the philosophy that I can't depend on the school system to teach my children something I want them to know. Either I have to do it or they have to do it. Um, because at the end of the day, and I used to be a teacher, so I guess I should say that. At the end of the day, you're teaching to the middle. Right. You're <laughs> just generally speaking, gifted, non-gifted, you're teaching to the middle. So you're going to teach the basics. You're generally probably not going to get as critical thinking experience as you would like just because you don't have time. Um, and I think that's where you have an issue with, but I also think, yes, there were some things that were purposely ignored. And in certain school districts, they do purposely leave out large aspects of our history that may be uncomfortable for some people well before i think cg you had something to say because i'm gonna say something no go for, go for it i think that um i'm not either opposed or um for critical race theory because i i think because i'm so abreast on mm -hmm. you know culture laws and just i guess basically from how i've been educated but I will say this much, sometimes it's not taught because you already know something, it's taught because those that do, don't know need to know. And when I say need to know, then you give a person an opportunity to have an open mind, you know? And what I see a lot of times is people shy away from things because one is controversial, two, it's um, not understood, and three, they just, just feel like, you know, it's, it's better just to keep silent. You know what I mean? It's better not to say anything because um, it's not applicable to me. But what I think happens is those that are against it, they get the opportunity. Just like the same thing happens with people voting and things that, that people don't do. And I won't go into that messy, muddy water. But I think what happens a lot of time is those that are against something, they scream louder. You know what I mean? Than those that are either don't care or for it because the the noisiest person in the room not they don't automatically make sense all the time but they it's are heard you know mm -hmm. what i mean but they are heard yeah. and i think that's where we're at with critical race theory the people that are not understanding they may be small and majority but they are making a lot of noises and they're making laws change you know and those who don't understand or who don't really want to be a part of this or just feel like, you know, hey, what is going on? But I feel like I better be silent. That's why it's becoming such a big to do right now. Go ahead, CD. It's, it's funny you're saying that because like, I, I don't know whether, <clears throat> you know, there are, there are a lot of things that I agree with and it. Uh, I don't know. If, I don't know, like, I don't know enough about it to say, anything about it, like as far as execution of it and where it should place it in schools. So right. I just don't know enough about this topic. Um, but yeah, I mean, I kind of feel the same, feel the same way about it. It's like, where do you, where do you really step into it? Do you, do you stay silent or open up about it? Cause it's like, it's critical theory at the end of the day. So if you don't have your basics down, doesn't matter who I'm talking to. I could be talking to a black person or a white person. You're not ready for it. Right. So, and then that's why I bring up the history portion of it a lot is because that all, you know, interconnects with it. So if you don't have that, those basics down, you're not, you're going to lean on your emotion and, you know, this, is, <clears throat> yeah, you're not going to be able to think, think critically about it. You're going to lean on your emotions, how you feel, 
whether or not it's been branded in your eyes as, oh, this is supposed to make white people feel guilty or, oh, we're supposed to feel, you know, it, you're going to lean on however it's been branded versus, okay, these are the facts about it. This is how, these are, you know, certain things happen. This is how it shaped X, you know, and came out with this outcome. Like, if you're not there, then we can't have that conversation. So I, I, I really just, I mean, I, I don't know where to start with this, like, to be honest, because like, I, I don't know where the focus should be should the focus be at like getting making sure that people get their basics out of the way because if we don't have the basics out of the way what are, we're just going to be pissed off arguing with each other the whole time and and that's and that's where we are that's where we are <laughs> exactly where we are <laughs> we're just pissed off talking to each other and no one's hearing each other mm -hmm. um but i'm really hoping that um pam i can't thank you enough for coming on with us and talking to us and explaining to us what, what it actually is. And so it's given me a better understanding just in the way that you explained it. Um, and when you have a better understanding um, in that aspect, then you as that one person can start by doing your part. I have grandchildren, right? So my, my children are already grown, but my grandchildren are of school age, right? So I have a granddaughter in sixth grade and one in fifth grade. So if I need to have this conversation with my son so that we understand and we make sure that they're being taught because those girls too are in, are in Catholic school, right? So more than likely they're not being taught this. So um, I think that's where we, we have to start. You have to start there and then let it organically go from there when these kids know when they understand. And as CG brought up when he was in school, you know, you know, I challenge my teachers, not because I'm being disrespectful, but because I know some things about history and I'm seeing that you're, it's not being taught. So how can I bring it into the conversation? And so um, if we start with us, just with that small part, I think that that can then grow and then we'll know how to um, not necessarily challenge those that are, well, you know, not, yeah, challenge right. those that are opposed to us, but be able to present our side. Mm -hmm. Pam, how would you like to, um, you know, to end today's call? Yeah, so I, I would agree with CG in that regard. And, and I think I have to remember that I, I am part of the elder generation now. <laughs> so a lot of things I honestly take for granted that somebody like CG would know, but he doesn't. Like I grew up in the 70s. I was so I understand how housing impacts schools because I was bused. I was part of the 70s busing program. So I that's kind of organically that just comes to me. So I understand it. Nobody has to tell me about it. But now when you bring up your grandchildren, um, I'm now I'm like, okay, so it wouldn't, they won't necessarily make that connection that I would just automatically make. So I wouldn't necessarily need a teacher to bring that up in class. And I think maybe that's something us older folks, dare I call myself that, uh, <laughs> Uh, really need to pass along to to the younger generation that we don't take for granted that they have the basic knowledge that a lot of us have. And maybe because it was to some extent part of a hurtful part of our period of lives that and we don't share it. We just assume they know it when they have no reason to know it. Mm -hmm. And so that will at least have us all starting with the same facts because if we don't all start with the same facts. You can't discuss anything critically. And, and to CG's point, that is the history. We got to all start with, we all have to agree on the facts. We might not agree on how those facts play out in today's society, but we do have to start with the history, with the basic definition of what we're talking about, and then we can move forward from there. Equally yoked. That's all we need to be, even be, being very young. Well, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for um, that explanation, because I think that, like I said, if anyone was unclear, unsure, or thought that they knew, um, or even did have a good understanding, I think just in the way that you presented it, it just made it a little more plain. And um, as my favorite line in you know, Philadelphia, explain it to me like I'm a six-year-old. And so <laughs> that way, <laughs> there's no room for misinterpretation or ambiguity at all. So Pam, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And um, CG and Kim, it's good seeing you as usual. And uh, I really hope that um, 
our listeners will, you know, really get a, a lot out of this. And so hopefully the conversation can kind of grow from here. Okay. All right. So thank you again for joining us for Let's Chit Chat, Sis. I'm Chauncey. I'm your girl, Kimmy. DG. Pamela Williams. All right. <laughs> we'll see you next week.